Malcolm here from Niche Advice, hope you're well. Um, I'm in sunny Hyde Park today and I thought I'll uh, let you know that I've recorded a fantastic video on bridging finance and especially on getting into bridging finance for the first time. Some of the main questions that I get continuously from uh, applicants. So I hope you enjoy it. Please like and subscribe as always. And uh, yeah, leave any comments that you've got, any questions you've got, and I'll be more than happy to answer it. Take care, all the best and stay safe. Niche Advice is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Everybody, it's Prime here from Niche Advice. I thought I'd talk about the most commonly asked questions I get when it comes to bridging finance. We're doing more and more bridging finance, but more importantly, we're getting a lot more inquiries on bridging finance. The problem is um, some of the people that are making those inquiries are making some basic mistakes in, in, in trying to sort of, you know, I can tell instantly by the type of questionings, by the type of questions they've got really, or by the way the conversation goes, um, how much information they know, and I suppose what sites they've been looking at and what people they've been talking to. So um, I thought I'd just try to clear up a lot of the uh, misinformation out there around bridging, and, and to give you a bit of an eye insight in some of the commonly asked questions out there. So let's crack on. There's 10 of the questions in total. So let's go through. Can you, right, can you get me a bridge if you don't own a property? So basically, if you don't own a property, can you have bridging finance? Now I've done several videos about bridging finance and I've done some certain ones around HMO landlords and buy to let landlords for the first time. Now, I've touched on this uh, subject on those videos and you know, like and subscribe this video, but obviously, if you uh, subscribe to our channel, um, you will see those videos. Um, where I've talked about, you know, because sometimes you cannot get buy to let or HMO mortgages, people are jumping into um, bridging finance. The, the, the answer to the question is, can you get it? Yes, you can. Um, the, the terms are not gonna be as sweet or as good as uh, someone who is experienced, who owns a property. Uh, I think fundamentally, lenders are worried around security. So not only they want a, a large deposit, so typically, I mean, the best out there is 25% open on working on open market value. And I'll explain what that means. But essentially, you need to have 25% of it. But the way it works with bridging finance, and again, I will explain that in the later questions, really, you'll probably need about 30% deposit to make things work. Um, so you're going to need 30% deposit. You can't do it with a tenner in the back of your pocket. You can't do it with no money down. You know, all of that sort of nonsense that you, you see in adverts or you see on YouTube. Um, if you're going to go down the bridging route, you're going to need some money behind you. And whether it's assets, so whether you've got some properties that they could take a charge on, or it will need, you know, 25, 30% deposit minimum. Okay, so that's that. But it can be done. If you don't own anything, you've got some cash to put down and you want to do bridging finance, that's fine. Now, something else I've, I've got quite a lot of, and this is not on the question uh, list, however, I'm getting a lot of people um, looking to get bridging finance on small properties. Um, often, oh, I want to buy a property for 65K, I want bridging finance. The issue is a lot of the bigger and better, frankly, better um, uh, priced bridging lenders They've got minimum property values of around 100k, so it's a little bit more difficult. There are prob there are lenders out there, but obviously their their pricing is not as keen. And you've got to imagine if they're going to give you and go through the hassle of the legals and go through the survey and go through underwriting for like a 30k loan. Frankly, there's no money in it. Okay, so they're not making any money. So you can't have the best of everything. Okay, you can't get a 0.45 rate with on a loan amount of 25 grand. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work for the lenders, it certainly doesn't work for me, because it doesn't really matter uh, from a work perspective, from a resource perspective, whether it's a 50K loan or whether it's a uh, you know 200K loan, okay? So you've got to tear that in, in mind, you know, this is, this is sometimes I've got to almost have this conversation with people whereby they go, yeah, yeah, but I can get much better rate. I've seen rates of 0 0.65, 0 0.45, 0.5, yeah, but you're buying a 25, you know, you want, to, you want to borrow 30 grand on bridging finance. So, bit of perspective out there, you can get it, um, and, and we'll talk about the, the rates. So, how much deposit do I need for finance? I've, I've sort of answered that one. Um, generally, the way it works, okay, so I suppose, let me go through how bridging finance works from a valuation perspective, okay? So, when you actually, uh, let's say you want to buy a property and it's for £100,000, okay? Now, 
there are three types of valuations, I suppose, um, when it comes to bridging finance. There is the open market valuation. Now, many bridging lenders, funny enough, do not work off the open market, okay? What you will find is what I call the more high street, primey, you know, standard vanilla lenders. They tend to work off open market value, and there's not that many of them, okay? So they will work off what the property price is valued now in the open market. Majority of bridging lenders, they tend to work off 180 day resale. So if they had to sell the property within 180 day, uh, day, what will it fetch on the market? Now, when the market's doing this and it's doing really, really well, there's not too much disparity between the two, open market and 180 day resale. However, when the market's sort of doing this way, I think that will have a big bearing. And um, I think we will see that more and more and more. Okay, so open market value, um, 180 day resale, which is probably the most common type there. And then you've got the 90 day resale. Now the 90 day resale, the, the lenders that tend to deal with 90 day resale, they may have other things. There may be a commercial transaction, maybe it was a part of a commercial transaction, maybe there is some um, adverse history there, so the client is, is more risky. So these lenders will say, okay, well, we'll lend you the bridging money, we will take into account your adverse credit or bits and pieces, however, we will work it on a 90 day resale value. So those three value values will have a massive bearing on, you know, the deal, okay? Because if you think that property is worth 100 on an open market value, it may value at 95 on a 180 day resale, and certainly on a 90 day resale, it might value at 80, okay? So that will make a hell of a lot of changes, you know, that, that has a massive impact on the deal itself. So not understanding that and this is, unfortunately, people put their money down. You know, people go to lenders, people go to brokers. Uh, fundamentally, this is not, I would say most of the, I'll be honest with you, most of the brokers dealing with this sector will know that, okay? So they, they will know, they will know which lenders are doing what. But when you're going direct to a lender, they're not necessarily telling you that. They're not telling you that up front. So they're not giving you their weak points, are they? They'll probably tell you, well, oh, this is the rate. Oh, great, but so-and-so told me they can get 0.45. Right, on what basis? Okay, what's the terms on it? What's the get-out cause? Is there an ERC on there? Are you tied in? So, and we'll, we'll get to all of that, but I am just I just hear this all the time, you know, and, and, and it makes me think, you know, where are these people? So, hopefully, watch this video and you, you know what, what you're talking about then, okay? Um, can you remortgage within six months? So... Again, this comes the back, off the back of lots of YouTube millionaire type sort of training sessions where they're telling you buy it on a bridge, do it up, and then refinance, pull your money out and do another one. It happens and you can do it, but it comes down to experience, okay? So have you got a couple of buy to lets? If not, then you're gonna find it difficult, okay? Is this your first one? Then more likely you'll probably have to keep hold of it for six months, okay? then you can ref, uh, flip it. Not necessarily because there's not enough lenders that will do remortgage within six months. I've got lots of lenders that will do remortgage within six months, okay? But they want some expertise there. They want some expertise. Now, there are some lenders we can still help. However, it really comes down to your circumstances, okay? So the answer is yes and no. We can do it, definitely. Um, but it, it, it really comes down to your circumstances. Now, let's talk about the added value bit. And this is another one that I get quite a lot of. In terms of adding value, um, the one that I get is I bought the property for 100K and three months later, it's now worth 160,000 pounds. Oh, really? On a downward market, you've managed to add, come on, you know, you need to come and run my business because you've managed to add 60,000 pounds within two months, three months. How have you done that? What have you done? Oh, um, I've just put a new kitchen and a bathroom in there and you know, uh, we've redecorated re the whole lot. You've added 60,000 pounds. You've almost, you know, you've added that much. Really? Um, and that's the conversation you've got to have with these people because they're going to go and spend their money, get stuck in, and then the, it'll get downvalued. Okay? Um, so when they say adding value, it's about substantially changing the structure of the property, maybe turning it from a three bed to a five bed, doing planning permission on there, extensions on there, changing the use, maybe turning it from a, a you know three bed semi or terrace into a HMO. That's adding value not a new kitchen and a bathroom and a lick of paint. 
okay? So if you're trying to get an uplift, you've got to wait six months, okay? If, if you do a lot, like, you know, converting the whole property, then yes, there are lenders that will uh, allow you to capital raise on an open market value within six months. Otherwise, you've got to wait six months. Okay, um, so that that's that's another one that I get quite a lot of people trying to re, you know pull out their money too soon. Essentially, can you take equity out after you purchase? Yes, you can. What are the bridging costs? So much. Why are bridging costs so much more expensive than buy to let? Well, it's more riskier. Okay, normal lenders can lend on properties because if if something goes wrong, they can repossess it. Most of the bridging properties, there's something wrong with them. No, not working, kitchen, bathroom, needs a load of money, needs a lot of work doing to it. Um, so that's why they want a greater level of security, hence the deposit. And two, um, a greater level of underwriting takes place on bridging. Although it's faster, um, you know, there's more risk involved. And you're not there with them for 10 years. You know, with the bridging lenders, typically you need to be in and out of it within three, six months, you know, maybe a year. But generally, you're in and out. So yes, it's going to cost you a lot more because if something goes wrong, the lender may have to repossess you. And if they repossess you, they've got to go through the pain of putting it right and then put it on the market. So, you know, nobody wants to repossess. None of these lenders really want to repossess. So, you know, it's, it's just about risk. And doing the numbers game and yeah it's expensive however if you know what you're doing bridging is fantastic i've got clients that are wealthy they're wealthy clients they've got money in the bank but they still use bridging why do they do that because then it's not their own money a lot of it is through the limited companies so they're offsetting a lot of their costs um and it can be done finance quickly if you know what you're doing there are good rates tax efficient quickly you can have the money and you can be running several projects at the same time, so you're not tying up your cash. So, yeah, it's expensive, but it's relative to how much you're going to make at the end of the day. Uh, and that's important. You know, somebody says to me, well, actually, the valuation costs this. And, um, and let's go through it. So I, I would say the valuation would probably double what a normal buy to valuation is. OK, so a buy to valuation is £400. The bridging valuation is probably around 800 The legals will be double, probably triple, because the legals is the most important part. Um, than a normal residential or buy to let case. So um, it costs, it costs a lot of, it costs, you know, it costs a lot more because there's a greater level of scrutiny on the, on the transaction. Can I get a mortgage for an auction rather than go down auction finance? <laughs> well, you could, um, but it really depends. Um, no lender is going to commit to completing within 28 days or 30 days. OK, at the moment, let me tell you, I'm sending emails to on case updates for some lenders. They've got a five, six day turnaround time just to read my email and come back to me. So no chance at the moment. Um, but there are little tricks you can do. If you've got own buy to lets, we can refinance those buy to lets, literally have it sitting there. So you're essentially a cash buyer. So you could do that if you've got assets in the background. So you don't have to go for auction finance. So that's one way people are doing them. If you don't actually want to get it refinanced, um, a lot of the lenders, pretty much all the lenders, will put a second charge on the property. So you're essentially, you know, it's 100% bridge because let's just say you've got some money yourself. They're going to lend you some money. Um, let's say you don't want to put any money down. You've got, an, you've got a property that's got a lot of assets, sorry. Um, you know, they'll, they'll put the charge on that property, say 30% of the property, and then the rest they will fund you. So there are quicker ways of doing it. Um, but yeah, now buy to let mortgage again in this in this climate. No, um, we have done them in the past because, you know, sometimes lenders have been fantastic in service. But now is not the time. And like I said, you need to have a backup plan. Even if you're going for that type of strategy, you've got to have a backup plan in place just in case that the lender doesn't come through. You want to be going with a bridging finance option or an auction finance option um, in the background. So, yeah. Um, why use a broker rather than a bridging lender direct? Very good question. Okay. Um, now I can give you all the waffle of brokers are professional. We know what we're doing, you know, this, 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 but essentially it comes down to, um, you know, preference. We'll, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you my advice. I'll be honest with you. I'm not tied into any lender. I don't care whether you go to any lender, A, B, C in terms of financial remuneration, they're roughly the same. So, 
um, and I actually work for you. So I'm I'm working for you. The lender's working for them for themselves. I have to work for you because I don't get paid until you finish your transaction. Okay, um, and the reason you should really be using me is not just for the bridge. It should be for the longer term exit strategy. Okay, so what are we going to do? Is this going to be a refinance job afterwards? Is it going to be sale? Um, I've got obviously experience with a lot of these lenders. It's just because a lender's got a flashy site with some comments on the website giving you some, uh, you know, positive comments on, you know, trust pilot or something. That doesn't mean that they're good. It doesn't mean that they've done your type of transaction before. It doesn't mean that um, they're not going to deal you deal with you in a certain way. And I, I fundamentally, uh, lenders are, you know, there to lend. Okay, so, um, you know, sometimes it, it works better to be direct uh, with uh, without the broker involved. Okay, sometimes it, it makes sense for us to be involved. Um, I would say uh, majority majority of the sort of newer, you know, if you've done two or three bridging cases in the past, um, you should go buy a broker. If you've done more than that, then you know what you're doing. Then, you know, if the broker is not adding any value to what you're doing, then go direct. Okay, but what I will say is things go wrong on bridging. It's not straightforward. Things always go wrong. Okay, and it's great to have a broker on your side because it may down value. We may have to flip it. You know, we may have to flip it to a different lender. We may have to do a retype. We may approach other lenders. We may go for the exit strategy. There might be a, you know, there might be a problem with down valuation. You know, all sorts of things happen. Okay, if it was straightforward, you know, if you've got a, you know, 20% loan to value deal and you think the exit is sale, then, you know, you may have to think about it. But things always go wrong and you want someone who's working with you on your side, um, not only for the transaction, for this transaction, but future transactions and also, um, you know, the exit strategy. So, you know, it's a free world. You can go direct and sometimes you get better deals direct than going by brokers. But sometimes you get better deals by brokers than going direct. So, um, yeah, it, it's just preference, you know. But I would be very mindful. I would always go down a broker. Not, not only because I'm a broker myself, but I wouldn't say just use me. I would say it's always best to go to the broker. And also, um, what type of broker? You see, we're fully regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. I can advise on regulated bridging as well as non-regulated bridging. Regulated bridging is essentially bridging that's for yourself to live in or a family member. Uh, so you've got some close ties in it. That falls under the Financial Conduct Authority. Non-regulated is a pure transaction, you know, pure, pure sort of investment uh, and commercial transactions. And we've got, we've got, I've got um, uh, authority to deal with both. And I think, you know, um, because especially if the exit route is buy to let, then it's always good to have uh, uh, be linked with someone who's got the wide range of um, access. Um, what's the biggest issues you come across within bridging? Down valuation. Buy a mile. Buy a mile. It's a different ball game. The, the bridging lenders have stipulated a lot more. They ask a lot more of the valuers. Okay. So down valuation, definitely. And that's why, remember we talked about <coughs> 180 day resale, multiple market value, 90 day rates. You know, it doesn't matter. It's, um, obviously it matters in the bigger scheme of things, but it doesn't matter if, if a lender is gonna down value it or is constantly is down valuing it via their panel of, you see, all of them have got their panel of valuers, okay? Um, so it doesn't matter if they're giving you 0.25% interest rate, okay? If it's gonna down value by 40 grand, 50, 100, 300, then it's just relative, isn't it? It's just a, it's just numbers, okay? So down valuation, legals, okay? Absolute pain to deal with, okay? So the way it works with bridging, nobody actually does anything until you've committed, okay? So they can send you all the decision in principle, you can have a conversation with me, you can fill in our forms, you can do anything, but until you've given your money, whether it's an application fee with a lender or a valuation fee, nothing really happens. And that's the truth of it, guys. So once you've given your commitment fee, normally a survey fee, okay, that's when things start kicking in, okay? And once you've had your mortgage offer, so the valuation takes place, you get your mortgage, you get your offer, bridging offer, the legal's kicking in. Now this legal, if anybody has done bridging, you can leave a comment here, guys. Am I telling the truth or not? So valuations, absolute pain. Legal's real big pain. 
especially if you you know if you're new to it you haven't got multiple deals going through you don't necessarily know the solicitor very well you know it becomes and and generally it's a, it's almost like a war between the lenders as chosen legal provider and your legal provider note here guys your guys normally are the ones that are messing things up not the lenders lenders solicitors do this day in day out they know what they're doing so it's important when you pick a solicitor they must know bridging not a normal conveyancer not a normal sister they haven't got a clue okay and that's where the problems arise okay it's not having the right people do it and trying to cut corners normally because you want to save save on cost because the people that do know what they're doing they will charge for it but trust me that will mean your transaction goes smoothly it doesn't take time otherwise it's an absolute nightmare so legals extensions okay and things that could go wrong so you go in for a bridge for six months i don't know it took you three months to get your planning permission oh my god the building works now taking place and blah blah blah, blah. you've put the property on the market it hasn't sold yet what happens when you're six months up so you've got to then ask for an extension now it depends some lenders may have a, give you an extension uh, on the same rate a lot of them they will hike your rate up um, and then you know depending on how compliant i suppose how uh, how well they treat their customers fairly um you know they will treat you in terms of um, repaying their asset you know repaying the loan you know, they may give you some time they may want proof that you've put it on the market there's all sorts of things but you know eventually if you don't get get your things together you know they're going to apply for repossession quite quickly a lot quicker than uh, you know residential or buy to let lenders okay so things like that do go wrong all the time okay so legals uh, sorry valuations first always down valuing legals extensions so you know can be dealt with Okay, so on the down valuation side part, as long as you know who the lender is, what they're valuing it, and open market value, you know, all, all of the usual things, then you can deal with that. Legals, just get someone professional who knows what they're doing, you know, and, and research them. I never like to recommend a, a, a solicitor for, for bridging, okay? Uh, it's a bit of conflict of interest there, and also things just go wrong, and I'll just get, end up getting blamed. So don't ask me for a recommendation. And in terms of extensions, you know, we can deal with that quite quickly. If you think the job's going to be done in three to six months, we go we go for 12 months. We just get a 12 months. Usually they've only got a couple of months, maybe one month exit charge anyway, or after three months you can get out anyway. So why wouldn't you do it? Now, there is a reason. Why wouldn't you do it? And I will come to that. I think we've got a question out there. Well, I might as well deal with it now. So what happens with bridging? You generally, um, a lot of people tend to, you can either service the loan. So you can say, okay, say it's going to cost you three grand a month. You can service that three thousand pounds. However, they may work out affordability on that basis. So if they're saying, "Okay, you're going to pay us three thousand pounds a month," you better be on a good salary, or you better have good income to be able to service that three thousand. So they will underwrite on that. Okay. So normally, just like a mortgage, you know, if you you know if you're going to servicing, say you've got a fifteen hundred pound mortgage, they're going to underwrite to make sure you've got the income. But a lot of bridging, what happens is the interest and the fees and everything is rolled up. Okay, so essentially it's rolled up and you pay all of that at the end once you've refinanced or sold the property. Okay, so what does that mean? It means, you know, that's 75% loan to value. It's not really a 75% loan to value because they've got to roll all of that up and say, if you do it over six months, say it may cost you, I don't know, £8,000, okay, or £10,000 over six months. But if you're going to roll it over 12 months, it may be £20,000. All of a sudden that £20,000 is coming off the bottom line. Okay, so that 75% deal might turn out to be a 70% deal. And you go, well, hang on a minute, you told me 75%. The, the website said, you know, I could do 70% or 75%. Yeah, but you're taking the interest rolled up now. Okay, so that has a big bearing, right? So you've got to know that. You've got to know that up front. That's why I say, look, guys, you can't just willy nearly get into bridging, okay? You know, you've got to know the cost. You've got to know the impact. You've got to know what you're doing. You need to be in and out, okay? So... You know, if you're going to do refinance within six months, fantastic. Do it within six months. Do a like for like. Get the hell out of there. We'll do a like for like. There's plenty of lenders, if you're on a bridge, that will do a like for like within six months. Okay, so you bought it for, I don't know, £100,000. Instead of saying it's worth £200,000 now, take the £100,000, stick it on a buy-to-let. Maybe a no early repayment charge buy-to-let product. So you can actually refinance it in a year's time. 
okay? So there are options, there are ways you can get around things, okay? But don't just go for the obvious, you know, it's, it's basic stuff, you know, um, have the money, have a backup plan, things will go wrong, it will down value, it, legals will take longer, uh, planning permission may take longer, permit development, the builders might mess you around. So all of those things, the buy to let lender could be a pain in, uh, in the backside for you to refinance. So you've got to have all of these wrapped up and work with me, you know, and that's why I say, you know, it takes you back to the question of why should I use a broker? Okay, you use a broker because they're experts, they know what they're doing and they deal with this. Okay, and that, that, that's it really. Uh, do I need planning permission to get bridging finance? Not necessarily, if it's being done on the primitive development, lenders will understand that they've got their own surveyors out there. Um, sometimes you do, sometimes you do, uh, and then it comes down to your level of expertise. Okay, so if you've done this in the past, you've got a couple of properties, you've got a couple of HMOs, you've done this in the past, yeah, I think they'll be okay with it. If you've never done it, they may have a problem with that. Okay, so, you know, it's all relative. Um, what type of broker do I need? Okay, well, here we go. I've already spoken, uh, I've already told you. And this is this article's on our website, by the way. Uh, I've put the blog on the website. So I'm literally just saying, look, you know, try to go with a broker that's regulated as well as non-regulated. But it's relative, you know, if you're just doing pure commercial transactions, you don't necessarily need a regulated broker because it doesn't really uh, apply. Um, go with somebody that's not charging you upfront. Um, We've just changed our structure, actually. We used to charge 1% of the loan amount. For now, we've actually gone standard £499, not paid until completion. Um, so you don't pay us anything, and when it's all done, you charge pay us £499, inclusive of that. Um, because what I want to do is, um, I want to write more business, and, and I want to, and the problem is we're getting a lot of loans for different sizes, shapes and sizes, and, and frankly, I want to be treating my customers in the right way, um, is... It can be a, a straightforward process, um, but you know, you've got to know what you're doing and I need you guys to be you know, on the ball. I need your documentation. We need to have a plan. We need to have a conversation um, and really um, try to uh, understand the picture and what you're doing. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave this on our blog on nicheadvice.co.uk um, with all the questions here. To be fair, the actual answers are a lot more detailed than what I've just said on the video. So hopefully you'll find it probably more compliant as well. More, um, hopefully you'll find it more useful. Um, I will be doing another video. So subscribe to this channel. I'm going to do another video uh, on full pricing. Okay, so I'm going to price out a typical deal. Maybe I don't know. Let me know. Let me know. Hundred, hundred fifty thousand pound deal. I don't know. Two hundred thousand pound deal. Three hundred. Whatever you think. Put it down. Uh, put a comment on there. And what I'll do is I'll just give you a typical price of a bridging finance for that sum of us. Let's just say hundred thousand pounds. You know, we'll work out the rate, rolled up interest, um, lender fee, broker fee of four nine nine. Um, chaps fee, uh, typical valuation fees, uh, legal fees. So at least, and then I'll go through them and then we'll look at, you know, I'll say well, what, what the rate is and what you can get, you know, you can get rate from, I don't know, 0.45, right the way through to 2%. And why does someone get this and why does someone get that? So we'll talk about that a little bit more. So I hope you found this useful. Please like and subscribe and let me know what you think about Bridging Finance. Let me know if you've, you know, used Bridging Finance, whether it was via broker, who knew what they were doing, fantastic, you can give them a shout out if you want, or whether um, whether you'd use the di lender direct, again, let me know, let me know your experiences with using bridging, um, and yeah, let's try to share and share our information amongst everybody, amongst all the, all the users here, channel, type of comment, and um, we'll see where it takes us. Thank you so much, take care, all the best. The content of this video does not constitute giving advice. It's purely for information purposes. All cases should be discussed with a professional mortgage broker before applying. As a mortgage is secured against your home or property, it could be repossessed if you do not keep up your repayments.